Hi everyone and welcome to our very first conservation in the classroom event of the 2022-23 school year. We hope everyone has had a terrific start to the year and we are looking forward to bringing you more fantastic events this year with our WWF scientists and experts. My name is Kate and I am your host. We are kicking off this year with not one but two presenters, Ryan Zlatanova from the WWF advocacy team and Reed Chapman, a young activist making impressive efforts to stand up for the environment. So Ryan and Reed are here today to share a bit about what inspired them to take action, why youth voices are so important, and what all of you can do to make a difference in your own communities and schools. So Ryan and Reed, let's bring you in to say hi to everyone. We are so excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Hey, everybody. Hi, guys. So before I officially pass things over to Ryan and Reed to share their presentation, of course, we want to take a minute to say hi to our special guests that we have joining us on screen today. So first up, we have Mrs. Jimenez's class, um, her eighth grader, eighth grade English class. Let's bring them on to say hi. No. <laughs> nice to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, we also have Ms. Borger's class from Altman Middle School, class 801 in Queens, New York. Come on, you guys. Say hello. Hi. 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 Awesome. Good to see you all, too. We can't wait to hear your questions. Just a quick reminder for everyone that is watching this on the website, be sure to place your questions that you have for our presenters in the form that you see underneath the video. We will try to get as many of those questions answered during the Q&A as we can. So without further ado, Ryan and Reed, I believe we are ready for you. So let's bring you back in and then we'll pull up your presentation and you can take it from here. Thank you so much, Kate. I too am ready and I can't wait to hear um, Reed's talk as well. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So as Kate was saying, uh, I am on WWF's uh, advocacy team. So we work uh, a lot with how to take action for the planet. And uh, what I really hope to leave you all with is that even though as a younger person, it can sometimes feel like it's it's really hard to know where to start. There's so many responsibilities and there's a lot of limitations on, on what younger people can do or are expected to do. But uh, there is a lot for you that you can be part of. There is a lot to do uh, to help the planet that is within, well within your reach. And so I want to uh, start off with a story. I am originally from Bulgaria, which is a small country in Eastern Europe. It's uh, uh, we, we have just glorious nature. Yeah, this is a picture I took actually this summer. That's my uncle over there. Um, I grew up really uh, going out into nature all the time, helping my grandparents on the farm. So it really nurtured a lot of love for the natural world in me. Um, this is a view from one of my grandparents' um, what used to be their garden. They're a little too old to garden anymore. But uh, And so I, I have this memory. I was in high school. This was maybe 10, 11 years ago. And um, there was uh, this campaign that WWF Bulgaria was doing in conjunction with other organizations. They were concerned that there were some infrastructure development projects about to happen uh, in one of our biggest mountains. And there was a lot of logging that was going to happen. And that was um, bad for the mountain for, for a variety of reasons. I don't even really remember most of them. I was just like, I cool. Uh, this is not going to happen. I'm going to do what I can to, to help and, and prevent this from happening. And um, so they had offered, they had provided a template for a petition and they were encouraging people, hey, get, get people around you to sign this. Let's uh, show the government that they can't let this uh, go ahead. Um, so I printed off a couple of pages from that uh, petition. I went around my family, gathering their signatures, telling them uh, why we, we can't let this happen. I was actually in my, my dad's hometown with my grandparents for my summer break. Uh, this is a view from the balcony. And I was going up and down this street that you see right here in this picture and just talking to the neighbors and telling them, please sign this petition. 
and you know some people signed a lot of people were kind of giving me odd looks and uh didn't i don't know they weren't they weren't very on board and in fact some people in my family outright said you know uh ryan you know that this is not really helping right like some signatures like why are you even doing this this is uh is this even a legit organization uh this can't really make a difference and i was i was quite outraged to hear that and if it, it only kind of encouraged me to to keep going um i I'll, I'll admit i don't know what exactly happened with that campaign i don't know how it worked out i would not be uh shocked if the development project did in fact go ahead because a country like bulgaria unfortunately has a unstable political situation and um sometimes it is hard to to have your voice be heard but for me that particular thing really that that particular experience really stuck out because there I was trying to be an activist with WWF Bulgaria and people were were like doubting me doubting those actions but here I am all those years later um, and I've been employed at WWF US for uh, four years now I'm getting I have a bachelor's in zoology and I'm getting my master's in conservation leadership and my my passion for uh, helping the planet is is only has only uh, grown stronger and my family is now like ah something to be proud of there so you know i i want to leave you with that and also ask you think about a time when you saw something going wrong and you took action uh how did you feel were were did you feel like people were doubting you or did you feel empowered to do it you know think about this and and maybe um teachers who are watching us maybe you can follow up with your students afterwards and, and have a bit of a, a discussion about that in light of, of this presentation. A couple of years ago, I was at a youth conference and a lot of people were saying, you know, we hear a lot, oh, youth are our future, youth are our future, but we're here now, we're also the present. Um, we shouldn't have to uh, wait to make a difference, right? Um, and in fact, there's an important statistic that I want to tell you about, which is that 16% of the population of the world are youth between 15 and 25 years old, and 26% are under 15. So that's a significant chunk of the world's population. And if nothing else, there's a big power in numbers. Um, there are, are so many opportunities for youth to group together and speak out for things that are important to youth. And just to explain this picture, um, this is a, a picture of some students in Cincinnati helping out a local organization that is um, greening the city and um, kind of landscaping uh, abandoned properties to help um, provide more shade, more tree cover in the city, and, and they're all uh, working together to help protect rivers as well. Um, like I said, youth shouldn't have to wait to reach a certain age before they can start shaping the world to be a better place. Uh, in fact, youth tend to be innovative and to adopt new trends and technologies the fastest. So there's that's a really big strength. Um, and then we tend to be creative in how we we carve out a space for our voices to be heard um and i want you to know that no action is too small uh no place is a bad place to start because we need big doers and we need small doers and i mean that both in the sense of you know we need young people who are doing things we need older people who are doing things but we also need small actions and we need big actions everybody starts somewhere um and even if you don't right away see the impact of your actions that's okay in fact sometimes it's in especially when it comes to helping protect the environment sometimes it's hard to see the impact of your actions until a while later but that doesn't mean that we should stop your your actions matter even if they 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 only help shape you to be a better leader and and be even more effective in helping the planet we need um everybody from artists to writers speakers engineers mathematicians accountants scientists landscapers uh everybody has a role i by no means was that an exhaustive uh, uh 
list, but everybody has a role. Every single one of you has a role. It's a matter of finding what is it that you're good at? What is it that you care about? And how will that, how, how can you use that to help the planet? Uh, and then there's, there's actually a bit of a, a secret advantage that, um, uh, youth have sometimes. So sometimes you are really doubted because you're young, but sometimes some people will actually be really impressed with your uh, younger age and may actually take you more seriously. Reed, who we're going to uh, hear about, hear from a little bit later, um, really impressed his congressional representatives at a lobby day to the point where they wanted to attend the meeting in person to hear from him. And so I want to give you a couple of examples, again, by no means exhaustive, but of, of how different actions can fit together and how they will all matter. So, for example, you can speak to your family about why protecting nature is important to you or, or about a particular issue in your community, at your school, even in just in your household. What little changes might you want to make? Talking to people is a really, really powerful way because when you talk to people who know you, to your friends, to your family, your words will often carry more weight because you have a relationship with them. And that's how you can spark a passion in somebody else. That's how my grandfather sparked a passion in me. Um, maybe uh, you want to be part of local climate advocacy groups. This is a picture of some um, young folks in Florida who were uh, demanding that the city of Miami declare a climate emergency. They had gathered and they were peacefully holding this sign. Um, there are many opportunities to be involved in particularly climate activism. Um, youth groups are, are in a lot of ways on the forefront of climate activism. And there's actually even an opportunity if you're so inclined to be part of that with your parents because there are groups that are specifically for, for parents. And so there's an opportunity for some uh, family teaming up there. Uh, another example is maybe you write letters to your um, mayor or uh, to your governor or even to um, Congress on on an issue that's important to you. Let's see, let's say that there's a river in your uh, state that is under threat, and you you feel like politicians are just not taking it seriously enough, or they don't know enough about it, and you want them to hear about it. You can write a letter to them. You can write a letter to the editor in your local papers, or maybe in your student paper, in your um, uh, school paper, uh, or maybe you write a blog post somewhere. Uh, that's a really, that can be a really powerful um, tool, especially if you are really good with words, you should really use that. Maybe you are somebody who wants to create an informational video um, you really like, for example, YouTube or TikTok, and you want to create videos where you just, you share facts about how to protect the planet and why that's important. Um, or, or you want to produce, uh, videos of, of yourself actually, uh, organizing a trash cleanup or, um, helping, uh, let's say, um, uh, helping do a cleanup at your school of, uh, collecting food waste. There's just so many different ways that you can tie your passions and your talents to protecting the planet. And so I'm going to stop there and pass it off to Reed, who in fact has a lot of experience doing just that. So Reed, just let me know when you need me to change your slides. All right, great. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so as Ryan said, my name is Reed, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why you should feel empowered to take action as a young person. So next slide, Ryan. Um, so a little bit about me first. I was born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland, which is right on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and I love traveling to national parks and doing a lot of outdoor activities. I really love skiing, sailing, and surfing. Um, and I'm super passionate about saving these special environments and the species that live within them because to preserve for our usage and a lot of generations to come. So next slide. So... Where it all started for me was a random March day in my, when I was in sixth grade. We had a snow day, so I had off from school, and my mom was going into D.C. to go to World Wildlife Fund's annual lobby day, and she asked me if I wanted to come with her, which I did, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, we got to meet with two of our representatives and a multitude of other congressional staffers, about why we thought that they should be including more money for conservation efforts in the budget for that year. 
Um, and as Ryan said, you know, this being a young person in this environment was a super powerful thing uh, because I was a con I was somebody who was going to be their constituent in a few years and was showing them a voice of youth that they don't normally see and somebody that they should really listen to because eventually I'm going to be voting for them to uh, whether they should be in office or not. Uh, and after that, I went back to the uh, lobby day every year after that, and I still do. And because of that, I got the opportunity to speak at World Wildlife Fund's annual dinner when I was in eighth grade. Uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting Philippe Cousteau there, who invited me to be a part of his World Wa uh, not War Earth Echo Water Challenge Ambassador Program. Next slide. So that's what I do today. Uh, I work with Earth Echo with their Water Challenge Ambassador Program, along with World Wildlife Fund's Panda Ambassador Program. Now, these are two really great examples of ways that you can get involved if you want to work directly with conservation organizations. Now, World Wildlife Fund's Panda Ambassador Program only accepts people above 18, but Earth Echo and a multitude of other conservation organizations will run ambassador programs for high schoolers, which you all will soon be. And my role with each of these organizations includes running programs for uh, my community in order to involve them in conservation efforts. And also for Earth Echo, every month I test the water of the Chesapeake Bay to make sure that it's healthy and, uh, healthy and hopefully growing healthier with our conservation efforts. Now, the other way that I involve conservation in my life is through the things that I love to do. So I want to give you this example because I think that it's a way that everybody can get involved with conservation without having to work directly with an organization if you just want to be passionate about it in your normal life. So I'm a level one certified sailing instructor, which means that I'm able to teach sailing to kids for uh, in the summer for summer camps. And this is really special because sailing is one of those activities that you need the environment for. You can't do it without it and you need a clean environment for it. So I get the opportunity to talk to my students and kids I'm teaching about why they should be concerned with protecting the environment and why we need to conserve the species that live within it to make sure that they're still able to enjoy the sport of sailing when they're older. And this is something that I really believe that everyone, including all of you, can do, which is to be involved with something that you love and bring conservation to it. So next slide, Ryan. Now, specifically, though, I want to talk about what makes me feel empowered. So for me, it's really nature itself. So we live in such an incredible world that we need to protect. And I don't want to lose everything that I love and everything that makes me happy due to our negligence. So these two pictures, um, and then the others on the next slide, so I can go to the next slide right now. I shot these all on an iPhone camera in my own town and, and places that I visited. And it's just really to show you guys how special anywhere in the world is. We, if you look around you, you might think that you live in an incredibly average and normal spot, but there's beauty everywhere and you just have to look for it. And I don't want to lose this opportunity because these places are being trashed and burned out by humans. And if we don't do something about it, it really will mess up our future and the next generation's future. So that's really why I feel empowered is because we have these incredible spots that I love and I connect to them. And I believe that everyone in the world can connect to some aspect of nature in some way. So I want to leave you guys just thinking about this idea. You don't have to say anything about it, but I just want you to think to yourself about what is some aspect of nature that really connects to you and makes you feel empowered to try to protect it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Reed and Ryan, for that terrific presentation. I'm sure um, that was a great assignment that you kind of left everyone with to think about that um, through the rest of the day and, you know, days to come of 
parts of nature that mean a lot to them. So we're going to get started with the Q&A part of the program here. So students, get your questions ready. Um, last reminder to those watching online, you can put your questions in that chat. We'll get some of those answered. But we're going to start with our classes that are joining us on screen. So first up is Mrs. Jimenez. If you are ready, we are ready for your first question. We'll um, have the student try to speak nice and loudly for us. Um, my question is, how can I support biodiversity in my community? I think Reed, you were talking about it really well. So maybe if you wanna answer first. Yeah, sure. Um, so. I think that the biggest way you can protect biodiversity is by protecting the environment that you are in. Um, so something really simple that um, I did la uh, last weekend was I was organizing a beach cleanup. Um, and this is a really simple way to you know protect the uh, environment that you're living in and protect the species, therefore, that are living in it. Because if you protect um, an environment, make sure that it's habitable for all species and they can't be, uh, they're not killed off, then you're protecting the biodiversity of that area. Another um, pretty big deal for me, at least um, in my community and a lot of other coastal communities is the yeah, problems of like overfishing. Uh, so in that sense, there are a lot of different things you can do I know for me, uh, people that live on the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, we all realize that um, laws and policies that protect our fishing and regulate our fishing are, is, are things that are very necessary to keep the health of the bay and preserve it for generations to come. So uh, anything you can do to support stuff like that, that um, protects uh, our natural environments, but also what you can do in the field to protect your natural environments. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm reminded, I actually just saw my landlady go out into our yard. Sometimes you can even start um, in your, literally your backyard or maybe your balcony. I was reading a, a study recently that showed that um, even backyard gardens with native plants can have a significant effect on helping protect pollinators like insects and birds uh, a lot of the biodiversity in like more let's say you live in a more urban or suburban area a lot of the biodiversity around us is not stuff that is immediately visible um, a lot of it is very important insects and other things that we can't see as much and maybe don't think about as frequently but there's a lot that you can do um, even little things that will make a big impact I'm always a big proponent of gardening if you are interested to to plant some wildflowers start yourself a little native uh native garden that that is one idea but you know do do your research on your local environment and opportunities will pop out at you that's great advice and i think um something to consider it's you know starting in your own backyard or your own balcony like brian and reed said the biodiversity that exists even if you live in a city right there's there's a lot to uncover there that you can help protect and speaking of city let's go to our group in new york miss borgers class if you're ready nice and loudly for us your question um, hi um, my question is how did you get into activism Brian, do you want to start or should I? Sure. Um, it really was uh, just a matter of realizing that if I want to see things change, I have to take some kind of action. And, um, you know, for me, I actually work in kind of ha helping activism happen, but certainly most people don't. For me, it was, it was just realizing that I enjoy activism personally and also I would really like to help other people be able to do it and do more of it. Yeah, for me, my personal experience, I got a little lucky. As I said, I was a random snow day that I had that got me involved in it. Um, but I've learned um, through my time as an activist there's a lot of different ways to get involved. So most high schools will have an environmental club you can join. That's a great way as a first step to get started. And if you just look out for um, 
organizations in your area? I know that I've seen uh, there's a small nonprofit that runs off a local river near us called the Severn River Conservancy. Um, and they themselves just will have volunteer programs. Any really nonprofit that you look for will have some sort of volunteer program that you can get involved with. And then it's just about up to you to be creative about the different ways that you can use these connections that you establish with different nonprofits. Or, as I said, you can just take the initiative yourself, go outside, pick up trash. That makes you an activist. Awesome. Okay. We are going to take a few questions that were submitted online. And I think that was a perfect segue to this one question that we had from Courtney in Utah, um, specifically for people under 18, what kind of advice would you give for how they can make a difference? Like what, pro what programs are available for youth? And I know you kind of just touched on that read, but I don't know if either of you had anything you wanted to add specifically to people that were under 18. I think uh, one thing I, I just want to add is that uh, I think we, we talked about this a little bit is that you, you don't have to jump into the deep and, and immediately start acting like doing like actually doing things. Sometimes it's OK to take some time and, and just learn and talk to some people, just kind of shape your view of things, understand the issues that you're you're trying to address. Um, and specifically as, uh, uh, as somebody under 18, you're in school most of the time, that is, you know, quite uh, in your, in your uh, field. So I would say that as one thing. And then on the other hand, um, again, in your local community, you have a lot of power, even with people who aren't part of any kind of an organization, just your neighbors or your friends at school. And especially in if you if you go to uh, if, if you go to a school and are not homeschooled, like organizing things within your school is um, can be a really big avenue for you. Yeah, I totally agree with Ryan. I'm in high school right now, so I know that, you know, you also have to balance anything you want to do outside of school with your schoolwork. And that can be a challenge sometimes. But school is a great way, as Ryan said, to organize. Um, like I said before, environmental clubs, anything that you can do to get your peers involved with the environment is great. Um, and I also, I want to say that don't be afraid of the fact that you're under 18 by any stretch. The, a lot of organizations are realizing that youth um, participants are very important because this generation is much more motivated than previous ones in order to get stuff done with regards to the environment. So there will be a lot more opportunities that present themselves to you guys. Um, and you just have to, you honestly just have to look for them because they're going to be unique to your own area. So I unfortunately can't recommend any specific programs, but in general, environmental clubs, nonprofits in your area, they will have opportunities for you to use. And that perfectly segues into this other question that came through um, from the website kind of related to that while we're on the subject of school and classroom participation. Sandra in Washington wanted to know what organizations can help students develop a conservation classroom project. So say kids that are currently in school that want to kind of participate in something, who would you recommend they like, where would you recommend they look to kind of get started? In terms of like a conservation classroom, um, I'm guessing that you mean more of like a, a getting a classroom involved with conservation. Um, and I would say just be creative. Like Ryan was presenting about gardening. That's a great way if you start like a classroom garden or um, I know when I was in elementary school, we raised monarch caterpillars, um, which was is a huge part of biodiversity. But, you know, there are a lot of unique ways for you to get involved. Um, and the, those are two just that come to my mind. Yeah, um, I think if even as, as simply as just doing a, a Google search with for um, ideas for 
classroom projects on conservation, some things will will come up. Um, but then, like Reed was saying, if you get connected with local organizations, sometimes they will help you develop things. Um, years ago, I, I worked for an ecological center in Ohio, where we actually were working with a local community center um, that also had like a daycare, and we helped them set up a vegetable garden, and we would help the kids come out and do the watering and whatnot. So sometimes organizations can help you develop those things. If there are no organizations like that in your area, like Reed was saying, you, you can try and start some things on your own. And then uh, I think the wild classroom resources honestly can also can also be a good start. You can get some ideas uh, there as well. It's a good shout, Ryan. Um, let's go back to our classes that we have on camera. So we'll go in the same order as before. So we'll start with Mrs. Jimenez and her eighth graders. If you're ready for your next question, <laughs> go ahead. Um, my question is, how can I help my family reduce food waste? Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I think that it really starts with think first and foremost, how you just how does food work in your household? How frequently do you go grocery shopping? How uh, what kind of thing? What kind of things do you cook? How big is your family? Do you buy a lot in bulk? Do you um, shop for uh, kind of individual product? Kind of getting a sense for all of that can be a really good first step. And then you start to think about, uh, you start to notice, okay, so when we finish our meal and we have some leftovers, what do we do with them? Do we forget them in the fridge? Or are we thinking, oh, okay, so we have some leftovers. How can we incorporate them in tomorrow's meal? When you're shopping for, um, for things, do you have a shopping list? Or do you go around the supermarket and just kind of pull things that seem like, Maybe you're going to use them this week using a shopping list. And in fact, if you have the chance to prepare a meal plan. Um, so sometimes on Saturdays, I'll be like, oh, here's some recipes that I think I'll make this week. And then I make a shopping list based off of those. So that way I'm not buying things that will go bad before I can use them. Um, and there, there are really creative ways to uh, reuse leftovers as well. I know that we have a uh, food waste warriors um, kind of kit guide on um on the wwf website so you can get some really solid ideas there as well yeah like ryan said i think um really a lot of it comes down to how you and your family function with their food i know that for me we'll have my family will have nights where we only eat leftover foods um to make sure that they don't go to waste um and it certainly uh, it certainly helps to uh, to keep leftovers and make sure that you always have um, you're never throwing anything out that can be used again. I think that that's really your main um, your main two ideas is what Ryan said with the shopping list. Don't buy anything that you don't need or you like plan ahead. Make sure that you're not buying unnecessary food. And then also keeping leftovers and making sure you eat them so that everything goes through you and gives you sustenance instead of going into the trash where it just wastes away. And I'll just add that you may already be doing it in some way. I think a lot of families, you know, will already have habits that technically are reducing food waste. You just kind of have to realize that, that you're doing them and how do you magnify them? And, and one thing is for things that you can't, help but somehow waste um if you have the ability to start compost at home not everybody can it's it can be messy it's it's really not something everybody can participate in but sometimes you can start it at home and use it in your own backyard you know the produced compost the produced soil sometimes your county or town will have a program where, where they can actually pick up your compost um so that's something you may want to look into that was a great question Let's go to Ms. Borger's class for your next question for Ryan and Reed. Nice and loud for us. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Connie. Um, my question is, what is something you want to accomplish that is not possible now? And why is it so important to you? Good question. That will take some thought. I don't know, Reed, if, you're, if you have your... Yeah, I mean, if we're talking really big scale... Um, 
I really want to see um, the U.S. go uh, have um, – have majority powered renewable energy sources. Um, that's something that I really care about because I think that it's the most pressing issue facing us. Obviously not possible right now because we don't have the technology for it um, and we don't have the infrastructure for it. And also I can't control that. <laughs> but, um, you know, smaller scale, I there's a lot of different issues in... Um, my community that I would like to see solved, um, mostly starting with like our um, our sewage uh, dumping ways. We have a, a problem. We have a there was a proposition put out to a um, put a golf course on right on the water in our neighborhood um, that's seen a lot of opposition. But I don't really have control over it at this point. Um, but I surely do not want to see that put up. Yeah, my answer is actually quite in line. It, it's about, um, it, it's quite similar. It's, th there are things about um, renewable energy and, and transitioning to like a green economy that at this moment are just really complicated or not possible, like Reed was saying, because we don't have the technology for them. The, they are select things. I will say the majority is possible. Um, but there are select things that we need a technological innovation. And um, I'm just really, really hopeful that more people will get involved in technological innovation around green energy, and we can more quickly come up with these ways um, to do some of the things that will help us um, cut greenhouse gases that right now we, we can't quite get there. That was another really great question. Um, okay, we're gonna take just a couple more from the website and then we'll try to sneak in one other quick round with our classes on screen here. So one question that came in from Deb in Maine is kind of more of a personal question. So I know that Ryan, you mentioned your grandfather, but were there other people that you both kind of consider role models or people that inspired you? Yeah, for me, it, st it really started with my grandfather. He was um, the deputy director of um, the local forestry department. And so like that connection was just really there all the time. But, you know, in my country, it's just very normal uh, for uh, my grandparents' generation. Everybody has farms. And so I was just always out there helping my grandparents on the farm. So all of my grandparents, a big thank you to, to them. Um, but I think throughout the years, just honestly, just like watching nature documentaries, um, hearing about um, Jane Goodall, um, hearing about just all the other people that one way or another are, are trying to make a difference, that collectively really inspired me and also reminds me of how, you know, sometimes we can have these like really famous figures that we all kind of know about one way or another. Um, but it's, it's, it's never really just them. There's so many people around them that will help them accomplish the things that, that they do. And so, yeah, for me, it's, it's really just been like a collection of people I've seen throughout my life. Yeah, I think for me, it's definitely my mom. Um, she has always really tried to instill love of nature with me. Um, she started her own small business. Um, and although she never really made money off of it she always she started out with the um with the idea that she was going to donate at least two percent of her profits to non-profits um like wwf which is how we all as a family got involved with them um so even when she really didn't have the means to do it she always tried to support as many as uh as many people as possible and as much nature as possible. But I think she really instilled a love of nature on me. And then as I talked about, I nature itself is very empowering to me because I, it's, it's, it's so incredible and it's so special to me and for my well-being and my health that it's just, that's really what inspires me. 
Great. Okay. So there was, there were two questions that came in that are a little similar. So I'm hoping we can kind of tie them together. Karen in Michigan was saying that they live in a city near Detroit that um, they don't often see a lot of wildlife. So kind of what are things that they could do um, to help the planet? And then kind of connected to that, Wendy in California was wondering how they can help endangered species. So to kind of tie them together, I know oftentimes when we learn about endangered species, species that may not live very close to us. I was wondering if maybe the two of you could just touch on how our daily behaviors could maybe impact species that are far away. Yeah, so one of the one of the things you'll come to realize um, if you look at nature is everything's connected no matter where you are. Um, so if in terms of like really wanting to help endangered species that are far away well first of all look around you you have nature no matter where you are because it's just hiding sometimes it has to go into hiding because of our human impact but it's there if you look for it um and most of the time there probably are endangered species near you as well so there are direct things you can do where you live to help endangered species um but if you really want to talk about like ones that live far away, you know, maybe on different continents, really trying to reduce like your pollution, your carbon footprint. Those are great ways that in the long run, you are going to protect these animals. So not using as much plastic um, and trying to conserve energy uh, in your house. Those are great ways that you're going to make a difference, even if you don't really notice it trying to turn off lights is a e super easy and uh benefit and very beneficial to the environment yeah I, I couldn't agree more really everything is connected what we do um here in the united states what you do in michigan what you do in california um has an impact around the world even if it's not uh, the con even if the connection is not like right there for us to see. Um, so there are ways that you can indirectly help endangered species uh, on other continents if that's what you're really um, into. I, I also agree that there are species that need protection all around us. Um, I'll also give one other example um, that is of a connection that sometimes we don't realize. So tigers live, they all, wild tigers all live in Asia. But uh, you may not know this, but there are actually more tigers living in captivity in the US than there are wild tigers in Asia. And so there's this law that, that WWF is supporting and other organizations are trying to pass called the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Long story short, you can read it about it online, but long story short, that law would actually help provide oversight over those captive tigers so that they don't fuel the trade in tiger parts and um, species. And so by helping pass this law on captive big cats in the U.S., technically we are helping wild big cats as well. So that's one connection that, you know, there are others like it. Um, you just kind of have to learn about them. Okay. I know that we are running super short on time. So we will try to do a speed round, quick answers. Hopefully, Mrs. Jimenez, if you have one more question for our presenters here. Yes. My question is, what fun things can I do with my friends? Wait, what? Oh, what fun things can I do with my friends that will benefit the planet? Reed, I think you may be more equipped to answer that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that I mentioned earlier that this weekend I got a bunch of my friends together to go out and clean a beach. Um, I think that, at least for me, whenever I do something with my friends, we can turn it into a good time no matter what. Um, but just being a, like, you can do whatever you want and just be aware of like, what your environmental impact is. So if my friends and I decide, oh, let's go take out a boat for the day, maybe look for trash along the way and pick it up when we see it. Just stuff like that, you can make it fun um, if you do it with your friends. And I think that's a great way uh, to 
make conservation a fun thing. Um, so honestly, I just say get your friends and go help the planet because you'll have fun no matter what. I have nothing to add. I agree. <laughs> that was a perfect answer. I think um, Miss Borger's class may be um, switching. I think their bell rang. So um, I want to wrap up and just thank Reed and Ryan. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, it was very inspiring. I hope you had a good time. And thank you to our classes that joined. We'll bring everyone in to say goodbye, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. 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 Bye.